Okay, so let's talk a bit about how this is turned into that. So you start out with the various layers, and uh, you can either weld them together or tie them with wire mm -hmm. or you know, just to make sure they stay together. And then the first stage is bringing it up to the right temperature. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the difference between hammering it by hand and uh, using the power hammer and using the press right over here? Hydraulic press. The big difference is just how sore you are um, <laughs> and how much mess is made. <laughs> so the nice and how much noise is made. That's the other thing. And occasionally how much fume rolls off because yeah. the hammers are always oily. The presses don't necessarily have to be that way. And how many burns you get on your hands by doing it by hand because you have the flux, fluxing agent spray off and it's basically molten glass landing on you and it kind of eats in. So. Mm -hmm. Having something that's separating you from the steel is a nice touch. Not always practical to put no. shields everywhere. No, it doesn't always work that way. No, but that's, that's why the hydraulic press and the rolling mill and tools like that have mm -hmm. kind of become the, the mainstay of most pattern welding simply because there isn't that spray that covers it, goes everywhere. And as Adam was saying, the hammer, you know, to lubricate the ram, the wheel comes down all the time and puff of smoke and, you know, we were just talking about breathing in toxic dusts and yep. so avoiding, avoiding all kinds of burning oil is good yeah. and uh, flaming molten slag. Yeah, it's fun times. Yeah. But you got to have them all though, well, right? Well, that's exactly <laughs> it. Uh, can you summarize like in, in fairly simple terms how the different layers of steel actually bond? What you do is you bring the metal up to a high enough temperature that the atoms are actually willing to move more freely and you create complete molecular diffusion by applying the right amount of force with the right amount of temperature. So not completely molten like a liquid, like if you were casting, uh, but not, you know, but past where we're still forging it, where it's kind of like a hard clay. There's this middle ground where the material can be coerced together by force or by impact, and the molecules will join. And uh, yeah, then that'll give us our pattern welding. But it's all in how you get there. Mm -hmm. And you judge the correct temperature by eye, you know, color, right? Generally speaking, it's by eye. I, I like to watch the flux sometimes. Mm -hmm. I find that if I, if I focus too much on color, well, if, if I have to do it somewhere else, the lighting's different. Mm -hmm. So it, it really plays, or in the sunlight, the sunlight's really, it really, you, you think it's not hot and it's just burning right up. Yeah, you can, you can easily misjudge by yeah. 800 degrees the temperature but if there's it, natural if lighting. The flux is bubbling just about right. It's, it's always that same constant. Or sometimes, or, fuming. or sometimes if we're using the same forge, we just know which, which PSI we're running, mm -hmm. and that, what, what that'll weld approximately, and then we're usually pretty good. And of course, if it sticks or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can feel it once you start hammering yeah. it, whether it's with a mechanical tool or yourself. It's a very different change in the feedback from it. Mm. You'll even get a different sound when you're forging it, mm -hmm. just as it becomes one solid material, the resonance goes through all the way and just the tone changes. What happens when it's too hot? The fun things. <laughs> when it's too hot, you can occasionally get that wonderful sparkler effect. And most of us grew up, you know, at one point or other seeing sparklers. And that's, in this instance, it falling to pieces because it's burning up. Mm. And you can also get excessive, excessive grain growth. And just some steels, if there's a lot of chromium in it, they'll actually fall apart. Mm -hmm. They can crumble. They'll crumble. And once you've overheated, that's typically that's basically it. There's not yeah, much it's, to, it's you can recover from. You know, there's no there's no recovery. It's the material's compromised. You might be able to weld it back and then make jewelry or something but decorative with it, it, but it's not something you can uh, sell as a knife or anything that uh, needs to needs to withstand the abuse. And what is glowing sparks flying around while forging, that's generally the scale coming off, right? Generally speaking. Also, uh, in, in the video, you'll see that the, whenever there's darker spots forming as it's compressed, that's the scale. And mm -hmm. uh, can you explain briefly what the scale is and why it's bad? <laughs> scale is... Um, Iron oxide. Mm -hmm. it's, that's, all, that's all it is, but it's, it's the chief enemy. 
uh, whenever you're forging, whether it be knives or anything architectural, it's, it, it becomes, you know, the, the iron on the outside, it fuses with the air and it fuses far more rapidly when it's heated. And, you know, we see it rust, it's quite a slow process, only, you know, a few thousands and then gets deeper over the years. Here, you know, over the minutes, it gets deeper. And if we leave it too long, it becomes embedded. If we forge it in, it's a defect because it's no longer a steel anymore. It's just iron oxide, so it won't, it won't be structural, structurally sound. It won't harden. It's, it's a defect. It's one of the things we don't want. One of the reasons is our enemy is because it can form between the layers. And that's the reason why many people use flux to help minimize that. Because if you form scale between the layers- It impedes the welding. Exactly, you're trying to join two pieces of metal that cannot connect because they're blocked by this oxide. Yeah, and the flux is the powder that you see here in the video. And yeah, that's what that does. So in a way you could say, if you don't use that worst thing that can happen is you can have rust inside of your blade, right? Or whatever you're, you're making. Chemi chemically, that's true. Um, what can happen is you have a spot that isn't fully welded. Mm -hmm. So force can be distributed inconsistently. And if you are, if it's at heaven help you at the edge, then you'll find that you've got this nice jagged piece of material that isn't steel right there. Mm -hmm. Even if you're, after you're done your primary billet and you're on to final forging, it's always good. We remove all the scale we can because as we get closer and closer to our final dimensions, ideally when you're doing your forging, you want to get as close as possible, do as little as gri little grinding as we can. Mm -hmm. So let's say we leave too much scale and then we start grinding and then a whole piece comes out and yet we don't have enough material to do the proper grind. So if we, if we ignore it, then it becomes, it compromises not just sometimes structurally with the pattern welding Damascus, it, it will finish the, it'll destroy the whole overall finish. It, we won't be able to grind it properly and then it's, it's no good. So when drawing out the material, that's uh, of course to shape it, to thin mm. it out, but it, it also has other effects, right? We're, uh, we're aligning the grains in the direction that we're drawing out as we, how we compress or how we fuller. We're always aligning, you have to almost visualize it as wood having kind of a grain. You know, especially if you're working traditional wrought iron or any, any sort of material made from ore where you have your slag inclusions, where if you fight your layers, you'll get splitting. Mm -hmm. But in our case, uh, if we forge it, we align our grains and it gives us much more compact molecular structure and we can get a superior product if we maintain the alignment, if we maintain consistency in, for its general use. Mm -hmm. If. Yeah, yeah. That's the keynote. But generally, I mean, knives are pretty good. Oh yeah, it's not hard to do them. It's when you start getting into... The bigger it is, or the more complex curves, the more tricky it is, especially if it's pattern welded. The final step is to reveal the, the pattern through etching, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, in, in this case, in the video here, you see that for demonstration purposes, it's a lot more acid than it would normally yeah. be used, just to make sure that it's nice and quick and shows up well. It generally, a lot of smiths use different uh, v volumes for it, but I like going three or three and a half to one water to ferric chloride, just because I find that a slower, deeper etch gives me a more consistent one. There's also one big factor is if it's too concentrated and you have a spill accidentally gets in your eye, mm -hmm. you have seconds before you can get permanent damage, whereas it would happen with a diluted mixture, we have half a minute or a minute. Exactly. So that ex extra time, you know, even if we have to wait an extra hour or two, it's, it's well worth it than the added risk of any accidents. And uh, yeah, it also allows us to keep an eye on how the etch is developing. Whereas if we have a very high concentration and we forget it for 15 minutes. And then you have some very interesting topography on it. Yep. Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, it's like a roadmap at that point. Yep, I've actually um, seen some Smiths work who have forgotten about it in the etch and you can see, you know, a 30 second of a drop on the blade. It's just staggering how much of a difference it makes. And, depending on the concentration or the temperature for that matter, that'll determine how rapidly it eats away the material. You'll do the initial etch, 
take it out, neutralize it, lightly touch up the, the top surface. And by doing that, what you're taking off is that very faint amount of oxidization that's gotten onto the more resistant layer, whether it's a lower carbon content, it's got nickel, it's got chromium, and make it a bit shinier. And that'll just increase the contrast between the light and dark. Many smiths do this through a number of processes. And then oil is your friend because unless you're working with stainless Damascus, which I've never touched yet, um, you're gonna want to oil it because even if you get all of it done, it will begin to rust just from the, um, you know, the ambient moisture in the air, especially because it's got brand new raw steel exposed. So I think we've got all the major steps of the process covered. Uh, if anybody else has questions, I may be able to ask them at some point. So finally, just for fun, why don't you talk about what you enjoy most about doing Damascus? <laughs> <laughs> the reveal. For me, that's the wonderful moment when you get to see why all this crazy effort you put in is paying off. Yeah, it just uh, looking forward to making bigger billets, more complex patterns, mm -hmm. and just yeah. I mean, the reveal is definitely one of the best parts. But like what you can what you can create, you know, with, you know, you start okay, it's a knife, and well, let's do a sword, or let's do some crazy, you know. I don't know, fantasy weapon mm -hmm. that you wouldn't think of it being made of a powder wallet, but you know, such big sections and just wow. So yeah, I like the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reveal is definitely the best part though of the process. Oh yeah. All right. And I think that should cover it. So thank you two very much for letting me record here, demonstrating, explaining. It was really awesome and great to see that in person. Thank you very much. Right, very welcome. welcome.